We're going to talk about strawberry disease management, uh, Ed Secor, extension plant pathologist. Uh, typically with strawberries, we see uh, things like foliar diseases, root and crown rots, and fruit rots. That was the case this year as well. Uh, I'm going to focus on five diseases this morning, uh, two crown rots, anthracnose and phytophthora, two fruit rots, botrytis gray mold and anthracnose fruit rot, and then neopestilosia. Opsis or NPT, which is a new leaf spot and fruit rot found by Dr. Connor back in uh, March with Jacob Kelly. These, I would say, the most five most important that we were concerned with this past year. Uh, with the crown rots, uh, we'll see this early on, as you see on the left, plants shortly after transplanting, dying. Uh, oftentimes in the springtime, you might see plants such as in the middle, where they seem to be doing, they're struggling. Older leaves are dying, upper new leaves still coming, coming out, but eventually these plants may wilt and die completely. Off to the right, you see some plants that seem to recover on the right side of that row, but never really reached a full, their full vigor as, the, as their neighbors on the left on that bed. That's probably Phytophthora right there. So sometimes they recover, but just never really take off. Very hard to distinguish the two, I, I feel at least. I think Dr. Connor might be the only one in the stake who can do it, but uh, in the field, they're hard to distinguish. Uh, we'll start off with anthracnose crown rot. Uh, you can see again, a plant in the upper left-hand corner that's struggling along. New leaves are coming out, but the older leaves are dying off. Uh, typically what I do is just dig up a few plants, try and cut the crown open, and then look for a, a reddish brown discoloration in the crown. And this will indicate either anthracnose or potentially phytophthora, depending on conditions. Uh, and anthracnose has different phases, if you will, but it can attack the crowns, the petioles, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit. Uh, plants may die after being transferred to the field, as, as I showed you earlier. And then you can't get this reddish brown firm rot of the crown. And it's hard to ID uh, in the field, at least, because the crowns of dying plants often just turn brown. And uh, that could be a lot of things. Infected transplants could act as the source of disease, typically. Um, we had a significant problem last year with anthracnose. This past year, it was not a significant problem. And as far as a management, I, I suggest, of course, planting disease-free material, material from a reputable dealer and uh, someone who we've had luck with in the past, of course. Uh, you can try to remove dying plants as soon as possible in smaller operations. You know, uh, Sometimes you could kind of compartmentalize the disease problem and, and keep it from spreading. And then you could follow a protective fungicide program, uh, usually beginning early in the season, if you detect anthracnose. And just a couple more slides of anthracnose crown rot on younger plants, and then a slide I think I already showed you on the right. But usually the best way to ID this is with the help of Dr. Connor's lab. By top to root and crown rot, it's a different animal in a way. It's caused by a water mold type pathogen. Um, oftentimes the plants may uh, wither and die in just a few days. They don't hang on like with anthracnose crown rot. And you get the discoloration of the crown, as you see on the right there. Symptoms often begin in the upper part of the crown. Uh, the young leaves will wilt suddenly and then get complete collapse within a few days. <clears throat> Plants break at the upper part of the crown. So when you're trying to lift these from the soil to check them, they might just crack off right at that soil line or at the crown line. The crown will appear rose pink or brown early on. So it's similar to anthracnose. Plants may recover, but are usually stunted. And Phytophthora is a water mold fungi, so it likes it. You'll oftentimes see this in poorly drained soils or poorly pockets in the field uh, where this pathogen will, will survive from year to year and where it'll first uh, kind of take off during the season. So management, I, I talked to one grower this year about potential fumigation because he had not rotated in three or four years. Uh, there are resistant varieties available. You want to provide good soil drainage and also avoid low wet fields and those with the history of the disease. This was just two situations this past year. This was a, a Jimmy Witt's son-in-law's farm up in 
Blunt County, I believe, but uh, you can see some of these plants dying off. And this was Phytopter, and you can see on the right that I was going uphill there, and this is a low wet area in the field. And <clears throat> wherever there was low wet spots, that's where Phytopter was taking off, and you could just see it more or less moving down the row. Uh, they thought maybe it's coming in on transplants, but I suspect that problem may have been in that spot uh, previously. And this was up in uh, Chip East area of the state, visited a grower there. He also thought he had thracnose coming in on transplants. He had plants dying uh, pretty quickly, also extending down the row. Uh, two things I noted, or I asked him, I said, do you have you that this really likes low wet areas? And he said, yeah, this field was flooded with water for about a month earlier in 2022. And this was also the third year of strawberries in this spot. It was right in front of a store, which was good, <clears throat> good for selling berries, but also good for Phytophthora. So uh, I recommended moving to a different spot on the farm and letting this field hang out in something else for a year or two, try and reduce the Phytophthora levels as the pathogen will survive in the soil for long amounts of time. <clears throat> Excuse me, and here you can see some Samples that Dr. Connor and I opened up from that field, you can see some of that reddish pink discoloration in the crown. So a different one, difficult one to detect, but Dr. Connor can do it uh, in the lab with various techniques. We do have a couple of fruit rots <clears throat> that we've been working on the last couple of years. Uh, Dr. Vincent and Dr. Connor and I have been trying to detect populations of both Botrytis gray mold and fruit and thracnose, looking for populations that are resistant to some of our more common fungicide groups. So Botrytis on the left, of course, produces a gray mold in the fruit, fruit and thractose on the right. Not much of a problem this past year, but more so last year. And Botrytis gray mold gets its name from the gray mold, obviously, and you can see it left to right, and fruit is almost mummi basically mummified on the right there. And that's just covered with fungal uh, mycelium, the fungal body and the spores of the pathogen. Uh, this is from a field in Lee County last year. <clears throat> I think the thing I want to show you in this slide, especially, is the two fruit in the middle uh, picture. Uh, you can see that tan lesion, more or less, and that's sort of the initial symptoms of botrytis, kind of a tannish, somewhat water-soaked lesion. And then under the right conditions, a little bit of moisture, uh, the mold starts to form very quickly. And you can see this in the field as well as on your kitchen counter. Uh, when those fruits start to really ripen up. So botrytis is widespread, has numerous hosts, it's basically a <clears throat> year-round type pathogen. It can survive on dead plant material. Free water and cool temperatures usually favor development, but I see it right through the end of harvest with the right conditions. <clears throat> Green berries do seem to be more resistant to infection. As far as management, you want to avoid disease transplants, but that's the disease will most likely still show up. Um, I always tell growers to try to avoid allowing overripened fruit to sit in the field. I tell new growers try not to overextend themselves in the second and third year, which uh, often is not the case. Uh, they can remove and destroy fruit, uh, but typically once, as you know, once growers start picking, it's hard to take time to destroy uh, infest the material. They're just trying to pick and mark it as soon as possible. So they kind of roll their eyes whenever I say that, but I got to tell them. Um, and I'll see growers do this and they put all the fruit at the end of the row, which is still the source of inoculum. So a protective fungicide program is the best control. However, we're getting resistance to fungicides and multiple frac groups. Uh, things like uh, Benamil and uh, the strobularins are becoming resistant. Uh, and that complicates the fungicide usage and the fungicide program. Uh, last year, I think the three of us visited about 26 farms, found resistance in uh, basically in almost all of them of one form or another, sent out letters directly to growers. And we'll continue that next year. This, this past year was a bad year for botrytis and, and thracnose as far as not being able to find it. Uh, finally, in, in thracnose fruit rot, uh, didn't see too much of it this year, but this is a, a nasty problem. You can see some of the sort of a sunken black lesion on the fruit, usually a little bit harder than what you see with botrytis. <clears throat> Upper left, you can see what almost looks like my thumbprint on that fruit, just kind of a sunken 
canker, if you will. Uh, eventually that can become tan and then black. And when you have wet conditions, you'll get orange to pink uh, slime or mold growing right on top of the fruit surface. So the source of this pathogen is, in, is often from nursery stock, favored by rain, high humidity, uh, moderate temperatures, spread within the field by rain and wind, and then dark lesions form on green to mature fruit. And the best management is to buy plants from a reputable nursery. And what we, I think we're having a problem now is a lot of our transplants are all coming from the same source. Um, I'm not gonna get into that too far. You can plant anthracnose resistant cultivars, sweet Charlie being one, there's a few of these. Uh, I did hear that these are not as, uh, might not produce large enough fruit for many of the growers to market. And they, I think sweet Charlie dies out early, but uh, they are available. Uh, I also say monitor fields for hot spots and remove infected plants. Uh, the, the fruit I showed you earlier was I think five fruit from or a half dozen fruit from six plants. The grower could have pulled those plants out, destroyed them, and probably stopped the disease in its tracks at that spot. But that's not always the case, usually not the case. <clears throat> One thing Edgar found two years ago was a uh, use of a pre-planned dip, and I think this is in the Southeast Regional Strawberry Guide. Uh, certain fungicides such as switch can be used as a dip to reduce <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Too much singing this week, I think. Uh, reduce incidence of anthracnose and gray mold. And basically before planting, you submerge plants in the dip for at least two minutes, let them drain off and then stick them in the ground. And that can uh, be a help with plants coming in that may be infected. Um, and also follow the strawberry IPM guide, and which, which was just, uh, we were, they were working on that two weeks ago. Last disease I want to talk about is probably the most, maybe the most important in our future, uh, Neopestilotiopsis or uh, NPT for people like me that can't speak very well. Uh, this is one that Dr. Connor and Jacob Kelly found out in Bruton back in early March. It's a new disease in the U.S., uh, sort of. Uh, first he, uh, identified in Florida a couple of years ago, then I believe in South Carolina and Georgia last year, and we found it. I should say they found it in uh, Bruton uh, early in March. Picture from Dr. Connor on the left where you can see these lesions on the, on the foliage, which he then identified as NPT. She also had molecular backup from University of Florida. Um, I came down to the same field a few weeks earlier. Uh, first time we saw the, the fruit rot phase. Does look like uh, anthracnose fruit rot at first glance, but then you see these dark, uh, dark lesions, very large with the, this black uh, discoloration to it, which is, I believe, a, cer a cervulae uh, type of fungal fruiting structure. So what little we know of NPT, it can cause extreme yield loss and destroy entire fields. It can spread quickly to other fields once introduced, especially after rain events. It causes a leaf and fruit spot initially, but eventually can infect the roots and crowns and cause plant death and it appears to survive in that area. A management would be to limit operations when the plants are wet, remove infected plants uh, if that's practical. And these are some of the same fruit that I brought back from the field with the fruit rot phase, but you could scrape that, that's something Dr. Connor showed me, scrape that lesion and, and you'll have these really cool looking slides with three tails on them, multicolored. So easy to identify, I believe, at least that those spores uh, once you get it into the lab. After that, I did look around this day with the help of uh, some of the regional agents. I was working with Olivia Fuller here. This is at BDA Farms, I believe. Uh, found some leaf lesions that I thought could be NPT or could be one of the other uh, foliar diseases. I brought these back and Dr. Connor confirmed these as NPT. Uh, found these lesions maybe on four or five plants in that field. This was the second year for that strawberry, those strawberries in that uh, about a half acre site. And we think possibly these came in on transplants that were used to replace skips in the field from the previous year. So this is up, I believe, in Hale County uh, in West Alabama. And then with Jacob Kelly, I interacted with a grower down in Baldwin County near the Florida border. And what I found was the least spot phase of the disease on the left, that's anthracnose in the same field on the right, not the fruit rot phase. But uh, 
these plants are at the very last row. Guy had a half a row that about 15 plants were just getting hammered by the leaf spot phase. And these are plants that he got from a friend from uh, East Alabama just to fill out his row and, and they, uh, they were infected with neopestilosis. So I think we've found it in three or four counties this year in the state. Um, so it's a, a can be a nasty disease. I'm not sure how bad it's going to get, but it's, it's not a good thing. Uh, based on some research out of Florida from two years ago, fungicides may have an effect on it. Products like Thyram and Switch, uh, maybe rotated with uh, Rhyme or Tilt or Inspire may reduce incidence. Limited information right now. Florida was trying to identify resistant varieties with, uh, I don't think they've had any luck with that. And they're also trying to develop new varieties with resistance to the disease. And that'll be our, our best way out of that mess. And with that, I'll stop. I always tell my students, always work with a crop that you could eat or drink in this case, but uh, some of my information, but I'll, I'll stop there and answer any questions you may have, or we can move on with the program.